Hi there, my name is Daniel Ramadan. I'm a Syrian Canadian author and the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library. And welcome back to the Public Salon. This is the last episode of the Public Salon, as well as the last thing I'm going to record as the writer in residence for the Saskatoon Public Library. My term is officially ending. Thank you so much for allowing me over the past nine months to be part of your community and abide in a virtual way. I am also truly thankful that I got to know many, many of your writers in your community, as well as some fantastic emerging authors, published authors, and I got to spend some one-on-one -on -one times with a lot of you. It was truly my honor to be part of your community. Today, I am uh, honored to introduce you to three fantastic authors who recorded some great readings for you. And I'm going to start with Leah Horlick. Leah Horlick grew up in Saskatoon. Her first collection of poetry, Riot Lung, from uh, Thrust Down Press 2012, was shortlisted for a Writ Lit Award and a Saskatchewan Book Award. She won the 2016 Diane Ogilvy Prize, Canada's only award for LGBTQ emerging writers. That same year, her second collection, For Your Own Good, from Caitlin Press 2015, was named a Stonewall Honor title by the American Library Association. After nearly 10 years on unceded Coast Salish territories, she is happy to be back on the prairies and now lives in Calgary. Her new book, Moldovan Hotel, was just released by Brick Books. All right, I'll leave you folks with Leah. Hello, hometown. It's Leah Horlick here, and I'm so honored to be part of this series for the Saskatoon Public Library, thanks to your incredible writer in residence, Danny Ramadan. I'm going to be reading three poems for you today from my new book, Moldovan Hotel, and I'm very grateful to Brick Books for releasing it into the world last month. And I'll start with the title piece for you. This is the first half of Moldovan Hotel. We count cattle, horses, the number of times people at home said, I didn't even know that was a country, soft sunset, reliable sunflowers. I send photos home, subject, guess if it's Saskatchewan or Moldova, a field so yellow it could be canola, tiny silver dome of a church, sky over gravel, exposed bone of communism old conversation unfinished, gold teeth. The first thing my parents ask me is, do you look like them? The first thing someone says to us in English is, you will have a good time in Moldova. It is very cheap for you and all the fruit is in season. Just do not talk to too many people you do not know. It was dark, barely, Blew like a pigeon, the street. There was one paved street. Trees in Cyrillic shapes just past the shadow of the border. And the carnival, it was a whole block, rotating circles of light. If there was music, I don't remember. We drove the whole length of Edinets in 10 minutes, slowly. No chirping from the GPS since Romania, suddenly ancient, Ukraine decades away. This must be it. A neon sign says paradise, a parking lot, a wedding. Creeping nausea across us like oil. The gas station was a long time ago, twilight pulling a little too close, miles since we cheered when the tiny black pigs ran across the road. At last, reception. Carpeted stairs, pulsing techno, a clean shower, that sense of rattling across the grid, the gravel long after we had stopped. Every 10 minutes, I want to duck out to the lot just to check on the car. We rub the dashboard and its white flank like a beast, a beast on whom we entirely depend. Without it, the little village of you and me and our passports is no village. Everyone listening in on our English is going to learn where even are we? Where even are we? 
anyone listening will hear me practice Eddie Nets point to a mouth, then quietly Yednets, like if I say anything too loudly in Yiddish, it will all come back. This next piece is called Ritual Instructions for Transnistria, and it begins with a travel advisory from the Government of Canada in 2017 that says, Avoid all travel to Transnistria in Northeast Moldova. In your right hand, take the 10-hour tourist visa. Form a window with your left. Frame the last functioning hammer and sickle flag. Walk six times around the last 20,000 tons of Soviet ammunition. A tanker spills cigarettes out of its side like a whale, and so we say, may the memory of this whale be a blessing. Wash your hands before you dunk your head beneath the x-ray at the checkpoint, the x-ray that pretends not to notice you. Rabbi, is there a blessing for the border? A blessing for the border. May God bless and keep the borders, seen and unseen, far away from us. This last poem for you is uh, about the reason I knew I had to write this book. Some of you might have heard it in a couple of places. It was lucky enough to win the ARC Poem of the Year Award in 2018, and it's called You Are My Hiding Place. The hole in the floor is old, old, old country. It lives under the kitchen table, yawns wide while the family eats, wider still when they starve. Cold above, so below. When the horses march up to the house, the hole, it has teeth, it chatters. Grandma says the hole is where the women go when the Russians come paramutation of hoofbeats, epigenetic fur hats, a long tablecloth, white knit lace brushing the floor. If a black boot peeks under the lace, if a sharp woolen shoulder leans down, suspects a wooden floor, a hidden circle, or a dirt floor, a carefully dirt-covered lid. If anyone sneezes, if a leather glove lifts the lace, folds the hole into a tiny helix, leaves a switch on a molecule, leaves a boot print in a bomb shelter, a gold button in the basement. If a woman opens her hand decades later, reaches for something, brushes away webs of dust, stares miles down into the sudden circle in her palm, says, what the hell is this? If you'd like to hear more, I hope that you will check out our local favorites, McNally Robinson or Turning the Tide to get your own copy of Moldovan Hotel. And I'd like to thank my incredible editor, River Halengury, who was so supportive to me throughout the entire creation of this text, as well as Brenda Lifeso and Elena Munz and Razel Bermudez at BrickBooks, who helped me put together an incredible virtual tour. It's so wonderful to be closer to you all now. I'm on Treaty 7 territory in Wilkinsis or Calgary, but I hope to be able to visit Treaty 6 again soon when it's safe to do so. And thanks again to the Saskatoon Public Library, my beloved home library system, and Danny Ramadan, your wonderful writer in residence, for the opportunity to say hi to you all today. Thank you so much, Leah, for that reading. I really appreciate it. Our next author is Callum Wilson. Cal Callum Wilson is a writer based in Saskatoon in the MFA program for writing at the University of Saskatchewan. He's also the co-host of uh, the River Volta reading series and the River Volta podcast. You can find them on Facebook at River Volta, as well as an editor of Wheat and Laurel magazine, also at, on Facebook at Wheat and Laurel a literary journal for young writers in rural communities, with a writing workshop uh, program and a focus on creating a remote writing community. I leave you with Colin. 
Hi, I'm Callum Wilson. I'm a writer based in Saskatoon in the MFA program for writing at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm also a co-host for the River Volta reading series and River Volta podcast, as well as an editor of the Wheat and Laurel magazine, a literary journal for young writers in rural communities with a writing workshop program and a special focus on creating a remote writing community. I'll be reading for you today some poems that I uh, have written in the program. This first one is called The Great Poet. I went to visit my friend, the great poet. He buzzed me upstairs to coral walls with druidic vines painted in crisscrossing sprouts, reaching the hearse black piano. They're roads, he told me. A map, I said. Maybe, the radiator hissed. My cat, he said. Of course, of course. He lowered himself into the full tub in suit and tie, snorkel and periscope, and said, bring me my typewriter on a trolley. Thank you. A sniper once taught him how to shoot said not to hold the breath because it will make you anxious to take your shot. You'll lose focus, panic, rush to shoot, and miss. So why the snorkel? He wants to panic and rush each word onto the page as he barrels headlong through the thin air of that yellow plastic tube, taking shot after shot after shot, because poetry is not shooting a gun. He doesn't ever, ever miss. The Used Book Look up from its tobacco-painted pages, close your eyes and smell. Your predecessor's poltergeist is found there. Tease out each allusion, as in poetry. Was it a gnarled professor nursing de Maurier's? The night nurse clutching her first break in a pack of nexts? Grandpa on the back porch with his church warden? The breath of day's work and evening's rest hides in those pages. You might, with happy accident, get a clearer picture from the marginalia. In blue pen... A student? Red pen, someone wise. In crayons, pencil, or wax, a true believer. See which pages are dog-eared. You might make new friends. Close the book and feel the spine. If it was loved, it should be whole, or cracked, if loved with passion. Take the box of ghosts home, reader, and leave your own ghost when you're done. Uh, this one is Blame Jack. I found what it was that poetry did in third grade, a classmate reciting some Jack Prelutsky. The headless horseman's hoofbeat caught me, and it was over. I was hooked. Our washing machine made a dance macabre of rattling bones behind my dresser drawers. By shiny nickel of moon, my cul-de-sac bully grew fangs and fur. Blame Jack for my poetry if you can't blame me, because I think he nailed it. His work helped me learn, while poem and dream are on the same street, nightmare and dream. Our next door neighbors. Uh, this one is, it was um, based on a prompt to write a poem about a color without naming the color. This color is what happens when a human built road intersects a deer built road, and because the deer and the humans cannot agree on whose traffic signals to use, there are bound to be incidents. It is flashes of motion against the black screen of night, and the incidents are not always fatal. <laughs> but if you're sleepy before they happen, you're wide awake after. I know people who've painted their bedroom walls in this color, or found it on a lampshade, on New Year's Eve at someone's house, warm like houses get, because the cold is so much colder on that night. I've had birthdays this color, found paper-wrapped nickels and dimes in the cake. I've read books this color, wrote poems this color, but I try not to. If you love someone, you won't see this color the way any other person will. In fact, you may never see this color at all until it's over. I'd make a case for this color to be a dawn color, and not just because some people shut blinds in this color to block out the morning sun in their offices. I could just as easy argue it for it to be an evening color, when I've seen it break apart rain clouds just in time to hit the patio to drink beers that are more like this color than not. Yes, it can be a color of nothingness, drab, unremarkable, but remember the pheasant who strut the earth and ply the air in their jackets and coats of fall-time regalia. They come from eggs of such a color. The color, of course, is beige, which I think is a, a bit of an unsung color, if you ask me. Some observations. It goes like this, Avenue 5th. It's rows of elms with trunks covered in staples and scraps of old poster. 
necks nicked by a quick and clumsy razor, patched with ragged tissue paper for this morning's meeting. For lunch on Duchess, a reduction of snow on a bed of brown boulevard grass. Shrubs have outsourced the roll of leaves to chickadees. Like any tempt, they're at this branch one blink, then another the next. In a backyard, a white rabbit makes itself as small as possible, fooling no one on a snowless lawn, taking nutrients from gardens down Venus trails or varicose roads into the fox mouth. Let the tricksters take turns outwitting one another. Across from Shangri-La and Forth sits a painting of Anubis in the muddy gutter. No doubt, for the same reason, you find the King of Crete directing traffic in purgatory. This one is called the Drizzleville Key Change. It's uh, actually the basis of uh, my thesis work for the MFA program. The Drizzleville Key Change. Behind your new digs, the ghost is rolling a beer bottle down the alley again, and the great brush stroke of moonlight on the wall is really just some storeroom's light bulb from the next building over. Because you don't need a ticket to board a dream, close your eyes and sink. That ghost is rolling its beer bottle up the alley now, with no other accompaniment, because no bird sings past 1 a.m. But rumble and roll in the dark all at once, the bottle and its ghost don't stop you from sleep from dreaming the hometown Drizzleville dream. What a name, Drizzleville, with his lone whistle train blowing past your back porch one night and around the moon the next. You look out the dreaming car window, and there it is, like on a TV, snowing static. It falls in great fluttering, pinwheeling flakes, like the days when the drizzle would bloat into snow, days of cigarillos stubbed out before the cafe, stomp the slush from boots and shoes, and the dream on its track going, Boots and shoes, boots and shoes, stomping the slush from boots and shoes. And Our Lady of the Coffee House, coming around to take the orders to and fro, counter to table to counter and back. Since graduation, she's been her own dream. She's been her own dream on her very own track, tracking it back to Drizzleville High, where you might have seen the boys on the brim of the pit playing saxophone, standing up for fun on those chilly, black, chilly supper nights. Some like it hot, and they really like to be eaten for free. Drizzleville High when it was cool, kicking pennies down the beige cavernous hall and up the sick green quarter pipe of floor trim molding. Pennies sail in an arc into the trash can. You sail into that trash can now, black bag becoming a night sky shimmering with September, spitting rain. Watch the ghost now, up and down the alley, no more bottles and no bird sings past 1 a.m., so filling in that night of Drizzleville's finest musical act, Who Am I and the What Happens? Train whistles and coyotes caroling, come see us, come see us, and never return. Watch that ghost now, he'll soft shoe nights like that, dance nights like that, in a thrift store suit and hat. He's no bird, you know, so he can sing. And on those nights, the coyotes ring Drizzleville with cheers. Blue yandering into the dawn, you need no ticket to board a dream. Still you wake up with a handful of crumpled paper waving for a moonlight conductor on the wall, construction out on the street in Saskatoon, Groaning metal noises in the morning might be a drawn-out, homesick, throat-sore whistle. A coyote engineer with its teeth on the pole. Thank you so much, Colm. I really appreciate it. And now we move on to Adam Pottle. Adam Pottle is a deaf writer whose work spans many different genres. His most recent works include the memoir Voice and the groundbreaking deaf musical The Black Drum. His books have won and been nominated for numerous awards, including Saskatchewan Book Awards, the Relit Award, and the Akron Planteau Prize. His other books include the novels The Bus and Mentee's Dreams and the poetry collection Beautiful Mutant. His essay, essays, and short stories can be found in this magazine, Quill and Choir, and Juniper. He is currently revisiting his new novel, Appreciations, as well as preparing a new deaf musical and a new short film. His children's book, Butterfly on the Wind, will appear in 2023. He lives in Saskatoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Poro, and I'm happy to be part of this reading that Danny Ramadan has organized. And thank you to Danny for asking me to do this, and to the Saskatoon Public Library 
for um for producing this programming. And of course for inviting Danny to be writer in residence. Yeah, thank you. So today I'm going to read a few excerpts from my brand new novel, Apparitions. And I've never read this uh or offered it in public before, so I hope it goes okay. So <clears throat> I'm gonna read just a few pages from the beginning and then I'll skip ahead just a little bit, okay? So here we go. <clears throat> Make a fist, tight, thumb crossed over your fingers, like you want to punch someone. Circle it upward and outward from your heart. Circle it twice, slowly. On the second arc, open your hand, like you're spreading something, sharing something. That's my name. Felix gave it to me. I'm not sure how long ago. I was younger. I still have difficulty with numbers. My parents never registered my birth. I've never been sure of my age. No matter, I'm here. Whatever they tell you my name is here, they're wrong. I don't live on paper. I don't exist on paper. I hope I'm clear. I learned language late. I feel like a child sometimes. There's no one here to teach me. Felix is gone. I miss him. His glittering eyes, his hands like flowing water, despite what he did. I want all of it out. Everything I've done, everything I've felt, everything I've thought. Nothing is in the past for me. I'm still living it. I see all of it, all the time. My father's house, the institution, what happened after. There's a monster inside me I need to cut out. It clatters and claws in my head, especially here. The walls push everything back at you, make me clench my fists. My name is natural. Neither my mother nor my father taught me language. My mother tried but gave up. She preferred smoking and lying on the couch and watching TV. My mother's face was always sad, even when she smiled. Her eyes never smiled with her. Whenever I ran through the living room in her house, she spoke with a mouthful of smoke. For a few seconds, her words were visible. That was as close as I ever came to understanding her. My father kept me below ground. From the time I couldn't reach the ceiling to the time I could almost bump my head against it. He took me from my mother. Everything was violent at his house. The way the cement floor was broken. The way the, way the cement chips jabbed my bare feet. The way the walls seemed to sweat like they ached to crush me. The way tiny nails twisted out of the wall all the way around the door. The way the door was always locked. The way my father and his people ignored me when I beat the door with my fist. The way the ceiling pressed down on me until my shoulders caved and my head hung. The way the light was always on. I had to learn to live with that light pressing down on me. Each night I turned on my mattress and faced the corner. I learned to create my own darkness. Time meant nothing. Only what my father and his people did. Everything was physical. All I know, I've clutched in my hands, or had ripped into my skin, or seared into my eyes. My first language wasn't sign. It was violence. When they spoke to me, when anyone speaks to me, they speak in ghosts. They fling invisible spirits of words at me. My father and his people hurled their words at me. Their words were hard or soft, usually hard. I tried to understand them. They wanted their words to penetrate me. They wanted to fill me with their ghosts. They wanted to haunt me, but I was protected. The way I am saved me from becoming like my father, preserved my heart like a steel box. That's what Felix said. My heart is safe, or at least clear, but my mind is a spill. All the years flat as a vomit puddle. My thoughts drift. I can't hold them still. 
My life is not my own. It's never been mine. Maybe now I can make it mine. Hold it in my hands the way I hold my words. Light found me, pressing soft and pink on my eyelids. I lay on my side, the blanket twisted off me. The soft blue morning light made the walls look furry. My neck hurt, my knuckle bled, it hurt to close my hand. Paper curled off the walls. Across the room was a square metal skeleton, all rusted ribs and thick limbs. A stained mattress slumped off the skeleton onto the floor beside it. The floor was old, dirty wood. My throat was dry as the paper. I stood and walked down the hall. The boards on the floor bent upward and bent upward in places. My arm hurt. My hand below the brake felt heavy, like it had turned to stone. I searched for whatever creature had pattered past me in the night then stepped carefully down the stairs. Every room was full of that furry blue light. My feet were cool. I rushed where I put my feet on the splintered floor. The whole house smelled like dirt, like it had been buried. Many of the walls had holes punched into them. A few had drawings of penises and silly faces. The cupboards held dust and empty bowls. I tried the faucets again. On the main floor, the front window had been shattered. The remaining glass had browned. I sat on a wall. On a, I sat on a chair along the wall. I hadn't sat in a chair in years. I felt uneasy. I stood again. One of the windows in the front room was intact. I walked over to it. Saw myself approaching the glass. I hadn't seen myself in years. <clears throat> I was expecting a child, not the tall, thin, dirty ghoul that I saw. I recoiled. Blood ran down the side of my face onto my neck. My hair hung off my head in snarled brown clumps, reddish brown clumps. Whiskers sprouted above my lip. My face was narrow, my skin was grubby, my teeth were gray and jagged. My eyes, my father's eyes stared back at me. I made a noise, a small ant of a sound that skittered up my throat. I touched my face, pulled at my whiskers, threw my hair back and forth. I shook my head. I turned away from my reflection. I shouted at the window, picked up a rock, and smashed every pin. I grew dizzy and dropped the rock and sank to the floor. I was alone. No one knew where I was. No one knew who I was. I didn't know who I was. Looking in the mirror, saw it nothing. I didn't know where I was supposed to be or what I was supposed to do. The prairie outside the window was open. It was green and open, but I couldn't go. I had nothing. I was nothing. In a vague way, I knew all of us. The thoughts sat in me. That's what happens with thoughts you can't say. They sit. They sink into you. I felt sleepy again. I lay flat on the floor. I was hungry and thirsty, but had no energy. The goat clung to my hair and skin. I touched the rip in my ear. I wanted to vomit, but I had nothing in my stomach. The house was empty, yet every room had weight. A rhythm waiting to start birthing. It nudged at me. Something flashed, quick and white. I thought it was a gun. The house trembled. Outside, there was another flash. Light filled the air. The house shook again. I cringed and hugged the wall. The rumbling worked through my body. The walls shook. I thought the house might cave, so I ran outside. The sky was a, was a ceiling of thick gray muscle. Flashes lit up the field with heart rate stabs that cracked the air. The ground rumbled but didn't shift. The rumbles came right after the flashes. They had a rhythm. They had power, bigger than any person. The rumbles started to hold me instead of frighten me, and I raised my hand, reached for the sky. 
my flashes dropped. I felt the rumbling from my backbone outward. My blood thrilled. I wanted to touch that power the way I touched grass. Multiple flashes surged down into the fields. Some of them fell from the sky, some of them looked like they shot up from the fields. I yelled. More white stabs tore down. The rumbles held me. My hand fluttered. I screamed with joy, full and free. The light and the rumbles and my body and my voice were all the same. The pebbles under my feet shook. I struck my eyes wide open to let in the light and stared at the places where it cracked the air. I yearned to live in such light. Within those cracks it seemed there was space for me. The white light soaked into my eyeballs. My torn ear and my bloody leg and my broken arm glowed. My pain was not just pain, it was more. The rumbles came down on me and my muscles quivered and my mind emptied. The air tasted new, like fresh rocks. I screamed again, emptied my lungs at the sky. Drops of water fell, light then heavy. I turned, thought someone had spit on me, like in the cage. The flashes and rumbles continued. Water fell hard onto me. The sky sweated. I opened my mouth, cupped my hand. I ran into the house and grabbed a dirty bowl from the cupboard and filled it and drank. The blood on my leg and neck washed away. My hair became thick. My, clung, my clothes clung to my body like a second skin. I got another barrel and sat it on the ground and laughed as it filled up. The flashes and rumbles faded. The water stopped. The air turned sweet. I took both barrels inside and sat by the window, sipping from them. The gray muscle in the sky slackened and emptied out like it was tired. An enormous feeling blurred through my body. I think it was love. Thank you. And thank you again, Danny, uh, for asking me to read and to uh, the, the Saskatoon uh, Public Library for producing this programming. Thank you. Thank you so much again to everybody who read today, to everybody who read on the Public Salon uh, series, to all of the authors who appeared on my author and author series, and to all of those who watched my series novel-ish. Thank you again for allowing me to be part of your community. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you so much for everybody at the Saskatoon Public Library for giving me this space and helping me turn it from a physical space into a virtual one. My office for the last nine months was here in Vancouver, but my mind has always been there in Saskatoon. Again, Daniel Ramadan, signing out. Salam.